Hi, you're listening to The Legal Hour on News 920 AM, The Answer. I'm here with Lewis on the Law. I'm your moderator, Sasha Hatfield. We have a great show for you today. Welcome to Lewis on the Law. It's a happy Halloween, guys. Uh, it's not quite Halloween, but maybe by the time this show airs, I think it's going to be close to Halloween. So we got a little bit of darkness going for you. And uh, Sasha, Francis, thanks for being on with me, guys. It's uh, good to have you guys here. Happy to be here. Uh huh. Okay. It's a pleasure. So the first case that we're talking about, and uh, and maybe the only case, but maybe we'll get to another one, is Kaler versus Kansas today. Uh, and Kaler versus Kansas. It is an interesting case because it's about the insanity defense and um, and it's about murder, which is good for Halloween. It's a little bit dark and uh, a little bit scary, but that's okay. Um, so, Francis, we're going to start off with the facts on this case a little bit. Okay, so the facts are there's a gentleman. He's diagnosed with several disorders. Uh, he's obsessive compulsive. He has... Um, he has histrionic personality and narcissistic personality disorder. At least that's what his attorney asserts. And so the guy uh, is married. He's happily married. He's got a great job. And he tells his uh, wife, his wife broaches the subject about having an affair with another woman. And so, you know, I, I don't want to get penthouse here or I don't know. Do they still make penthouse magazines? I might be showing my age here or something like that. But uh, I don't want to get penthouse here. But he says, OK, uh, honey, it's fine if you have an affair with another woman. So we know that's not going to go well. And uh, so she has an affair with another woman. Things get rocky in their marriage. He gets really, really jealous. His life falls apart. He loses his job. He's um, he's melting down left and right. He's unable to cope with his wife having this affair with another woman. It continues beyond where he wants it to go. And uh, and they end up getting divorced. His wife moves in with her grandmother and uh, brings her kids with them. So the guy snaps. He drives to his grandmother, her grandmother's house, and murders the wife and her and her and two of his kids. He lets the son escape, and he also ends up murdering the grandmother. So there we have it. The and uh, and of course he's arrested, and uh, in in court. He basically raises the insanity defense or his attorney raises the insanity defense. And uh, he claims that he just could not stop himself. He could not refrain himself from murdering his wife, his two kids and uh, his grandmother. He let his son escape. But the other two kids, they got off. So what do you think about that? I mean, it's certainly interesting. Uh, The idea that he had an irresistible impulse i think there was some um evidence to suggest that he had let the son escape specifically because he felt like his daughters were siding with his his ex-wife and the son wasn't well that sh- that seems to me to show a little bit of r- rationality but but backing up a little bit i think i think one of the things that that we want to talk about here initially is that that the insanity defense, and we'll get later into why it's in the Supreme Court, but the insanity defense itself is an affirmative defense. So, and I think when we say an affirmative defense, what we're really saying here is that the defendant has the duty to prove this defense, whereas usually it's it's the burden of the prosecution to prove their case. Here in in an affirmative defense, the defendant has has the duty to prove his de- his his case here. So, yeah. oh, sorry, no, um, with his, did he have his diagnoses before this happened or was that? Yeah, he, that later? He, he had a diagnosis before this happened, but I think, I think they, they got into it really as this, as this case developed, his, his attorney was like, what happened? How'd this go? And they got a psychiatrist. He's already on, he was having a mental breakdown, uh, uh, during the marriage, which led to the end of the marriage. And, uh, so this this uh, mental illness, as it were, uh, was occurring during the whole entire time. And wasn't he prescribed medication that he didn't take? Am I remembering that correctly? That, that, Is that part of it? That's absolutely correct. Okay. He was prescribed medication. He went off the meds. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I think you've like heard you that. Like you do. Yeah, like you do. You go off the meds because you know what? They just don't make you feel good. You like being murderous and, and <laughs> crazy, I guess. I mean, that's the only I mean, thing. I mean, I do. 
you, you yeah. like being murderous and crazy. Hey, that. And what are you going at for as Halloween? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's my son's birthday, and he's going to mm-hmm. be an electric eel, so that probably means I'm also going to be an electric eel. Or Wait some minute, kind because of Because your son is going to be an electric eel, you're going to be an electric eel also? Solidarity. Uh, okay. Yeah, why not? Uh, okay, sure. <laughs> why not, huh? Francis, how about you? What are you going to be for Halloween? You know, there's still a, a couple of options on the, the shelf. Mm-hmm. Um, it's looking at this point like it might be part of a group ensemble. It might be Shaggy from the Scooby Doo game. <laughs> so we'll have to see how that okay. shakes out. I get it. You got you got the tallness, the red hair going on. All you got to do is mess up your red hair and put on one of those green sweaters. I mean, I really want to find like a really you know out there wig. Uh-huh. I think that would really just make it a lot more fun to have. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, Shaggy looks a little like a hippie. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know when you actually look back at it and like, hey. But I, but you know, Sam a little while ago told me that I was using the term hippie wrong. That nowadays hippie means something different. So what does it mean oh, now? Really? I don't know that you're hip. Is is that it? It might have meant that back then. Too. Sam, don't don't play coy mm-hmm. with us. Yeah, don't play coy with us. If you got something, let it out. <laughs> yeah, I just don't like to hear it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think that's that's certainly a fair uh, stance to take with regard to just about anything like mm-hmm. that, right? You, you know, don't want to be derogatory. Yeah. Exactly. And we're being derogatory here because we're back to the murder case. Yeah, let's get back mm. to murder. Yeah. So uh you're right. You're right, Sasha. He is off his meds. Okay. So he's uh he's he's melting down, he's breaking down, he's off his meds, he can't take it anymore, and he goes and he kills his wife, uh, his two kids, and his grandma. And you're absolutely right. He let his son escape because uh because um he thought the daughters were siding with the mother. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how hard is it then for him to prove his insanity? You know, um, that, that, that's a, that's a difficult question. And I think, I think it's the evidence question. And, um, and, and I think the, the, the standard is clear and convincing. I'm not sure on that, but I think the standard on an affirmative defense is clear and convincing. And so, you know what? I am not a criminal attorney. So, so well, and even if you were a, a criminal attorney, James, I mean, this is a, trying to apply Kansas law to it, right? So it's uh-huh. like the difference between Kansas law and Georgia law, trying to get into that. I mean, for the most part, the way it would work in Georgia is that, yeah, you'd have to then prove insanity, right, as an affirmative defense. Uh, and it'd be a question to the jury, right? Mm-hmm. It'd be a question to the jury as to whether or not he um, had the mental capacity mm-hmm. to distinguish between right and wrong, mm-hmm. right? If he can't distinguish between those two, then he's missing the sort of criminal intent that we look for in order to convict somebody for a crime. Mm-hmm. Um, so if he's incapable of having that intent, right, that malicious intent, that criminal intent, the, mm-hmm. the mens rea, as we mm-hmm. call it, then certainly um, he would be insane, mm-hmm. right? He wouldn't be mentally culpable for his crimes, mm-hmm. um, which, of course, doesn't mean that he should be released back out onto the street or anything, but it does allow uh, for sort of a different set of penalties and um, consequences to be applied. Yeah. And, and I think, um, here in, in Kansas, if I'm not mistaken, and you're right, we're in Georgia. So we're talking a little bit about, about Kansas's, um, insanity defense. And they had a slight variation on the monoton test, which is something I, I, uh, never pronounce well. No, what is the monoton test? The, <laughs> the monoton test is a test for insanity where um, a person is not criminally responsible for, for an act uh, when mentally disabled and they don't understand the nature and quality of the act that they're committing. And as, as Francis said, they don't know whether the act was right or wrong. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, that's based on a guy, Daniel Minotin, you know, back in um, the 1800s. Is this- who was sort of the, the first uh, insane. Was, was that the guy defendant? who went crazy and killed people in parliament? Why don't we find out after a quick break? I think we uh, need to stop here. But when we come back, we will continue talking about that. And before we go, I just want to let you know that you can find us on Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. and streaming on pretty much every major platform there is. We've got uh, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. Have I missed any? I think you can ask Alexa to directly play this episode for you if you've got the smart home. So find us.
Welcome back to the Legal Hour. Today's show is brought to you by Lewis Legal and Dixon Law LLC. Gentlemen, before we jump back into our program, will you tell the people how to get in touch with you? Uh, thanks, Sasha. Um, my name is James Lewis, and you can always uh, email me at james at jameslewislegal.com. Uh, all these shows are actually archived on my website, so you can go to jameslewislegal.com and go to the video blog page and the podcast page, and you can go and drift through all these past shows. This show will be archived there also. You can also give me a call at 404-610-0075. And we can be found at dixonlaw.com, D-I-X-S-O-N-L-A-W.com, and by phone at 404-480-4420. Francis, we were talking about monotony, and it's not monotonous, but it is it is <laughs> very cool. So we were talking about monotony. So what is the deal with monotony, and how does this apply to what's going on in this case? So so as we were sort of getting into, Daniel Monotony is this guy who back in the 1800s in um, England uh, shot the prime minister's secretary. Uh, <laughs> he yeah, shot he the saw, prime minister's secretary? Yeah, he saw the private secretary to the prime minister on the mm-hmm. street, went up behind him, pulled out his pistol, and shot the guy in the back. Um, when he later turned himself into the magistrate, or I think he actually got apprehended on the scene, and, and in his first sort of statement, um, said something to the effect of, you know, these voices made me do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's all he would sort of say, and as, you know, criminal law developed, it sort of recognized that, hey, there are people out there who might be mm-hmm. so sort of divorced from reality that they can't really understand their actions. They, they don't really understand what they're doing. They don't mm-hmm. understand right from wrong and how it applies to what they're doing, and they're sort of acting involuntarily. Um, and that's where we get this monotonous test that breaks it down into sort of two parts, this uh, what we've sort of come to colloquially refer to as the insanity defense, mm-hmm. right, that a person is not criminally responsible for an act when, the mental, when a mental disability prevents that person from knowing either uh, the nature and quality of the act or whether the act was right or wrong. And, and of course, uh, many states have slight variations on on the monotonous test, and Kansas itself uh, has, and and excuse me, all you Kansas attorneys out there, (laughs) I'm not a Kansas attorney. I don't know Kansas law. I've just gotten this from what I read about the case. But I think Kansas, uh, Kansas replaces the right or wrong test at the very end with the irresistible impulse test. And uh, obviously he had some kind of irresistible impulse that he had to kill his wife, his two of his kids and two of his three kids and his and his wife's grandmother. Why the grandmother? Uh, Yeah, I don't know. I I I think it was just sort of a again, you let the sun go uh, based on, you know, the Mm -hmm. evidence that we've got. It seems like he let the sun go because the sun was on his side. So presumably the grandmother would have been on her. You know, and I wonder what side. I wonder what kind of effect the fact that he was able to consciously let his son go, consciously make that decision, has on the fact that this was an irresistible impulse. It feels like if it was an irresistible impulse, it was just take over. Absolutely, you know. I mean, certainly, um, I think that with regard to sort of the way the evidence shakes out on this specific case, um, it sounds like there's a lot of premeditation going on, mm-hmm. right? Which I think is kind of where the crux of the dispute comes from. And again, uh, we've only been able to get very lightly into this, but it seems like um, where the real kind of conflict comes from is, you know, he uh, understood the nature and quality of the act, right? Mm -hmm. You you can't really make an argument based on those facts that he didn't. The question is, you know, that that you would then apply in the 48 jurisdictions that haven't sort of taken this departure Kansas Mm -hmm. has is, well, did he know it was right or wrong, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if he's inside his head and he's he knows what he's doing Mm -hmm. but he doesn't understand that it's wrong because of some sort of mental disability then of course that still removes that mens rea that Mm -hmm. removes that criminal intent but if kansas replaces that that right and wrong distinction with an irresistible impulse Mm -hmm. and says it has to be either you don't know what you're doing or you can't stop yourself from doing it they remove that you know, examination of whether it's right or wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think the conflict and why this case ends up in front of the Supreme Court is because is it a removal of due process, right? The Eighth Amendment has this prohibition, constitutional prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. But is it, do you, is it really cruel? And I think, I think this is, I think this is one of those, uh, one of those death sentence issues. I mean, is it cruel and unusual to, uh, to kill someone who has murdered several other people? Uh, 
I mean, I guess they're saying it's cruel and unusual because he doesn't, he can't stop his uh, his irresistible impulse. And that's exactly the sort of stance that they're taking, right? Is they're saying, hey, you know, this is a death penalty case where this man has been basically sent to death by a jury of his peers. Mm -hmm. And he's been sent to death because the jury of his peers wasn't allowed to accept that he didn't know what he was doing was wrong as a means of sort of taking him away from that, right? If we put him into the situation and we say, hey, here's a guy who's so mentally disabled, and again, we're not trying to really examine whether or not this guy is or isn't, because there mm -hmm. certainly are some facts that suggest he's maybe not the, the, the strongest candidate for the insanity defense that we've seen, but mm -hmm. if we take a, a man who does not understand, right, that what he is doing is wrong, mm -hmm. and we kill him for doing those things, Right. That's I mean, that is sort of an untenable. That's a that's an unfavorable result. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead, if it's somebody who is so sort of mentally divorced from reality. Right. Then then what the fair response, what we want to do in this country, what sort of the po public policy has been, has been, well, let's get them treatment. You know, mm -hmm. like, let's see if we can help them overcome or, or or live with this mental disability in a way that, you know, doesn't unfairly punish them and doesn't, you know, basically do so because of a mental disability they don't have any control over. So you brought up the Eighth Amendment. Mm -hmm. Can we break that down for, for our listeners who might not be as familiar with constitutional law, um, what the Eighth Amendment provides? Um, well, first, the Eighth Amendment, especially as applied to this uh, case, um, it provides that uh, that uh, that the states can, or that the federal government in the Eighth Amendment, the Bill of Rights originally applied only to federal actions. And, of course, later through the 14th Amendment, uh, these this Bill of Rights uh, was found to, uh, or the, the, govern, the federal government instituted uh, the Bill of Rights to apply to the states to the states themselves. And so here we have the Eighth Amendment, um, and, and in this case, it's the cruel and unusual punishment aspect of that, whether this is a cruel and unusual punishment. And um, and that... That's what actually is being tested here on the on the Eighth Amendment in in, uh, in the Supreme Court is whether this is a cruel and unusual punishment and whether this applies and whether the federal government can uh, can say that states themselves cannot assert or states themselves have the right to get rid of the insanity defense and um, and that that becomes that becomes a states a federalism issue and federalism. Uh, is is where basically two entities have have control in one area, and you have the federal government with its laws, and you have the states state governments with its laws, and the battle becomes over over what rights do the states have to institute their own laws, and whether they can get rid of this insanity defense. And right, and it's I mean it's a very interesting question, right? Like the, um, and it's sort of predicated. On, on like a hypothetical, essentially, like what happens if we were to come up with a mir miracle cure for a certain mental disability tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. let's, let's say we have somebody who's suffering from such a significant mental disability that they can sort of go out and commit murder and have no idea that what they're doing is wrong, mm -hmm. right? And then lo and behold, there's some sort of overnight, you know, uh, epiphany in the, mm -hmm. in the medical industry mm -hmm. that comes out with some sort of cure that can immediately address whatever that specific mental disability is, mm -hmm. right? Then you'd sort of have a situation where you'd be able to go up and say, specifically, this is a different person, right? This is a person who, when they committed these crimes, did not understand that they were wrong. And here today can conclusively show to like a med medically certain degree uh, that he now is no longer a dangerous society, right? Mm -hmm. That he, he now understands that he has been cured, he has been fixed. Right. I mean, in that situation, you're dealing with a, you know, a potential somebody who needs to go back out on who would be basically forgiven for their crimes. They'd be freed. They'd be released back out on the street because um, the law would have to recognize that, one, they didn't have the sort of mens rea when they committed the crimes. So they mm -hmm. weren't convicted of it. Mm -hmm. And two, now they no longer pose a danger. So they don't need to be institutionalized any longer. And. And it's it's interesting. I think the Eighth Amendment also has issues about excessive fines and excessive bail, and I don't think those actually apply here. And even excessive fines and excessive bail that goes back to to um, to 
to the issue of cruel and unusual punishment. And when fines and bails are excessive, then a uh, cruel and unusual punishment um, can can take the take place. And I think I think a couple of other issues here that that, that broach on the federalism subject, um, whether the states have the right or not, or to um, to get rid of the insanity defense, are substantive due process in the Fourteenth Amendment. Also, well, why don't we come back to that when we are back from our break? We will be looking at all of that and more, including the lighter side of the law. Welcome back to The Legal Hour on News 920 AM, The Answer. We have left off with the 14th Amendment, so if we could jump right back into that and clear that up. Yeah, I I think think, uh, the 14th Amendment, I think uh, think here is is where where the federal government um, says the Bill of Rights itself applies, Bill of Rights and, uh, and due process applies to states also, so that states cannot deprive an individual of due process. And I think the really interesting thing about this case is on one of the briefs that are filed, um, uh, one of the organizations in support of, of the insanity defense um, brought up an interesting argument. They said that that um, that the that the insanity defense is is codified or was was brought into common law in England, but it but it has its source in in a much deeper and and. Uh, Farther reaching social norm that this is that this is a codified or a, a common law a codification of of a social norm that evolved that people this is just the way and, and what they're saying is this is just the way people think they think if you're flipped out and um and of course this isn't a technical legal term but if sure. you're flipped out you've lost all control you shouldn't be held responsible to the full extent it's not that you shouldn't be held responsible at all for your crimes. But to a certain extent, certain things are forgivable or maybe not forgivable. That might not be the right word, but you can't be held understandable. Res- maybe. Yeah, you can't be held responsible to the full extent that someone who is mentally competent at the time should be held responsible. Right. And um, so I think that that that's kind of an interesting, interesting take on this. And, and it brings up it brings up something that they call substantive due process which as far as as far as i i know doesn't actually exist but it's kind of implied in within within uh the bill of rights in several different segments so so really i think i think an interesting thing here is and the supreme court will decide this is is whether the states and and whether he is actually having uh one of his basic and substantive due process when you're really talking about it, you're talking about basic human rights. Yeah. And, and, and so basically his attorney and several special interest groups are saying that he's having a basic human right, the, the right to assert, uh, assert the insanity defense is a basic human right that is not only codified but comes to us from, from social norms, from the way we actually think as a society. And social norms, of course, der- turn into laws themselves. And so – this becomes the way that we build this coercive structure that guides society, and so I think it's I think it's pretty interesting. And uh, and of course, when when the Supreme Court actually decides this issue, we're going to have a follow up on this. Yeah. So yeah. So, which brings us to our second case of the day. It's going to be Lucky Brand versus Marcel Fashions. And, and Francis, this is a completely convoluted case, and I'm going to try and get through the facts, and maybe we'll get somewhere to the issue of claim preclusion and issue preclusion. Sounds good. So Marcel Fashions versus Lucky Brand. It's an 18-year-old. And I got to have either of you guys ever have a pair of Lucky Brand jeans? Yeah, absolutely. You have a yeah, pair of Lucky I Brand do. jeans? Yeah. Really? Among other things. Yeah, I, I like them. I have a pair maybe of, I won't after this. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that's going to matter. This is a this is a trademark dispute, so it won't matter on the quality of the jeans. I have a pair of Lucky Brand too, but I don't think I ever wear them. I my, think you should. <laughs> my wife told me they were like a good brand, and I was like, really? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, does yours have the get lucky uh, mark? Think probably. Or the I think lucky. it's like on the pocket or something. It's hidden, but it's there. Like, okay. and I, they're not new, so uh-huh, yeah. I'm not sure where in this dispute. They uh-huh. came in, but okay. Well, that is that it. is what they're disputing. Yep. They're disputing the use of get lucky, 
And um, it appears that that Marcel Fashions had it copyrighted, at, or it was a, it was a registered trademark. It's a little bit different from a copyright, a registered trademark. And uh, Lucky Brand started using Get Lucky on their clothes. And, uh, of course, Marcel Fashions, just as any good capitalist endeavor does, they sued them. And that's always fun because it means lots of – and this, is, this goes on for 18 years, so this is tons of work for attorneys. So they sued them, and, um, and there was a settlement agreement. And, uh, and they settled the issue out of court, uh, and uh, Lucky Brand – continues to use the get lucky uh you lucky um mark yeah and uh and uh and so what do you know they get sued again by marcel fashions for continuing to use the lucky uh the get lucky mark and lucky brand during their during their initial uh during their initial motion to dismiss they actually they actually brought up the issue that that uh that Marcel Fashions had released the trademark, and uh, they never brought it up again. They didn't argue it before before the jury, and uh, and and Marcel Fashions basically wins. Okay, so years later, this still goes on. Lucky Brand loves the word lucky, so they start using <laughs> lucky again in another mark. And what do you know? Marcel Fashions sues them again, and uh, and Lucky Brand says, "Wait a minute." You can't, you can't do this. Uh, this this issue this uh, this issue has been released. They tried to bring the release the release defense that they did not use earlier right. in their original case, and so and so Marcel Fashions says, "Wait a minute, you should have brought that that defense already because you haven't brought that defense. That claim is precluded," and uh, and so. That brings the whole thing of whether a claim preclusion can apply to a defense. And can, can mm -hmm. you tell us more about what claim preclusion means? Okay, so claim preclusion differ, differs a little bit from issue preclusion, as in claim preclusion demands that all all issues that could have been litigated at an earlier time should have been litigated during during that same earlier occurrence and. Uh, I actually picked this case because I have a a, a, a case uh, that's going to be or that's already being litigated in which I'm saying uh, this 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 uh, this actually I I'm bringing both issue and claim claim preclusion up and so uh, so I thought you know I'll, I'll pick this case because that way I can work through the details and and in, in my case it all it, it all derives from the same incidents and occurrence. And uh, and they've already sued her once, and they settled on a on like a Jerry Springer show type. It oh, was one wow. of those. It was Judge Judy or Jerry Springer, <laughs> and they settled during that. And anyways, <laughs> binding and it, that those type of shows are binding arbitration. So wow. So anyways, and they have sued her again. Now they want to sue her in a court of law. And of course, my defense is that you know their their claims and their issue are precluded. But here, I'm going to distinguish between claim preclusion and issue preclusion. Is is in claim preclusion is any issues that should have been litigated uh, should have been brought at that time, and if they weren't, um, then they're precluded. Yeah. And issue preclusion is any actual issues that were litigated at an earlier time; those are precluded from being litigated once again, especially if they happen out of the same incidences and occurrences as, as an earlier issue. So it sounds similar to double jeopardy. If I'm yeah, understanding it, that. it is. It's it's, okay. it's it is basically the legal the legal term of double jeopardy. You can't just keep suing a person over and over and over again over the same incidences that happen. So uh, so uh, I think I think it's a little bit funny because because Lucky Brand continues to just continue to go goes on and on about. Uh, about suing or Marcel fashions just continues the suit over and over again. And lucky brand continues to use the mark. Well, I mean, and that's one of the problems that you have with sort of all continuing litigation or continuing mm -hmm. harms, right? Mm -hmm. Like in nuisance cases, that's I something you see, too. <laughs> that's something you see all the time mm -hmm. where, um, you know, as long as the nuisance is of a continuing nature, mm -hmm. you can be thrown out of court, um, for you know procedural reasons or, or whatever, mm -hmm. and as long as it's still occurring at the day after you've you've um, been thrown out of court, mm -hmm. you can jump right back in. Yeah, and and I think I think that's one of the reasons there is claim preclusion, issue preclusion is is to, especially as, especially if someone has is 
I mean, in a nuisance case, when they jump back in, it usually means that that the issue was not settled or they didn't file for the right type of relief, which would have been injunctive relief of, of some sort of specific performance from the other side of some source where, of some sort where they've actually stopped them from from continuing this action over and over again. Uh, if they didn't get that straightened out, then it's too late. It's too bad, right? And then it's the issue and the claim have both been precluded. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It runs. I mean, it runs into a situation where, uh, you know, I mean, they're two different tools, right? Claim mm-hmm. preclusion is a much bigger sort of hammer than mm-hmm. issue preclusion. It is right. And so, uh, the reason to distinguish between those two is because you want to know when you're using the hammer and when you're using, you know, a little. Screwdriver. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> a I'm trying nudge. to think of yeah, something, uh-huh, something that's yeah. a lot more sort of delicate, right? Yeah, instead of a hammer, yeah, right. And so, um, the the sort of the the question the court's going to have to look into is whether or not that can come up and and bar defensive postures, mm-hmm. right? Because that's certainly sort of a different thing. These are both. It is, tools. It is a little bit different. Uh, is it is because it usually happens. Claim preclusion usually happens when a person is is is. Uh, bringing an action right. rather than when someone's defending an action. Exactly. Those are both tools that are used by the court mm-hmm. to help limit the scope of the litigation, mm-hmm. right? And to say, we've already been here before. And let's get deeper into that when we come back from our break. Welcome back to the Legal Hour on News 920 AM, The Answer. We're going to finish our discussion about defense preclusion and then jump into something a little lighter. Yeah, just quick before the break. I mean, what makes this case so fascinating is the fact that it's taking, you know, these two tools the courts mm-hmm. like to use, right? The hammer and the, the scalpel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, now that I've had a second to think about mm-hmm. it. And, um, <laughs> took you a second to come up with a good illustration. Yeah, it took, took a second. Mm-hmm. Um, it's late. It's late on a Wednesday. You know, yeah. gonna, hey, we've both been working all day long. <laughs> yeah. We're both going to be working all night long. And, you know, this is just a, <laughs> sort of a typical week for us. <laughs> I know, right? But, but no, you've got those two tools that the court likes to use to sort of trim down the case. Mm-hmm. And here... The, uh, you know, the appellee, or I'm not sure on the procedural posture, but mm-hmm. whoever's bringing this defe- like this mm-hmm. defense is saying, hey, they can't use this to defend against our action, mm-hmm. which is, is just fascinating, right? Because it's not yeah. usually a tool to help the, the attacker of the yeah. litigation mm-hmm. um, make their attack more effective. Yeah, so it'll be fascinating to keep an eye on this one. Yeah, see where it I goes. think I think it is because because the uh, the the plaintiff usually doesn't doesn't say, wait a minute, uh, I'm bringing a, a claim preclusion against your defense. You know, it's almost always the other way around where the person bringing the action and it's the person who's defending against the action who says, wait a minute, that action is precluded or that issue is precluded or that claim is precluded. You know, actually, you mentioning it, I have had to make that argument before in court though. As a defense, as a, as a defense, uh-huh. I've had to I've had to go in, and I've had I had a case where they argued that we had brought up um, an issue sort of improperly and mm-hmm. needed to file it into a separate case. Mm-hmm. So we went and filed it into a separate case, and then they tried to argue the supposing party tried to argue that, that we precluded. should be yeah we should be collaterally stopped mm-hmm. from bringing this new action mm-hmm. um, as opposed to. Uh, having it adjudicated the prior action, and I was able to use as a defense that mm-hmm. they were judicially stopped because mm-hmm. they had basically taken a, a contradictory posture in the previous case, and they'd mm-hmm. won on it, right? Mm-hmm. They'd gotten, they'd won on it, and mm-hmm. so they were barred from raising that as a defense now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's kind of where they're going here, and then we'll see if that actually, if, 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 in, in your case, it would, you, you would have been precluded from bringing that defense because you should have raised it earlier. If right. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. It's it's uh, hard to say. Okay, so that is enough. I think we've gotten really convoluted in that case, and I hope <laughs> we didn't get any of the facts wrong out there to all you attorneys listening, because I know there's several of you guys out there. They're going to fact check me on Monday or whenever. whenever <laughs> though. I'll get the fact check emails. They're like, well, I don't know about that, James. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, you try and do this radio show every <laughs> week. <laughs> See how you, you start do. your own. So on the lighter side, I want to end this show with with a funny and lighter look at the law. So we're going to start off abroad here. Um, Are we going to Sweden? We're going to go to Sweden. That's what I was hoping we were doing. Because where else do they make ice hotels? Okay. 
So Sweden has, of course, this law that all that all hotels have to have fire fire safety equipment. And uh, voila, there is a hotel that is made completely out of ice. <laughs> Can you imagine that? How cold does it have to be to build your hotel out of ice? Sounds uncomfortable. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like a Disney movie. You know, it makes me think about Frozen where she's like flying around. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something to think about. Well, the, yeah, the, the, the question is, is there, is there anything to even catch on fire in an ice hotel? I mean, how, I mean, where does the law That's go from point. here? I think, I mean, they have decorations and furniture inside that they are not do. made of ice, I believe. And I think that is, that, that is where the Swedish government is coming in and saying, well, it's not all made of ice. You have little things that can be, that can burn or catch on fire or mm. whatever. Have fire you. probably couldn't get very far. Yeah, Sweden but. and their ice hotels. Who would have thunk <laughs> it? Okay, the next story I wanted to kind of bring up is um, is uh, can a person force an employee to wear a leprechaun suit? And we're not gonna, <laughs> we're not going to mention any senator's name here, but it seems like a senator uh, was requiring one of, and this is a state senator. We're not going to mention the state senator's name or the state because I don't want to be sued today. Um, <laughs> but anyways, and anyways, it's 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 on the news. Anyways, it's out there. You and can Google I, it if I, you really want to know. I think yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so the senator has has required her chief of staff to wear a leprechaun suit. And he says, "Why? Why? Do we know why? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For fun? It's absolutely. Not St. Patrick's Day. I, I think. I think. Yeah. I think it was St. Patrick's uh, Day or some holiday, or she wanted to be festive, but maybe she thought he looked like a leprechaun. You know who looks like a leprechaun? Conan O'Brien. He looks like a leprechaun, except for yeah, like a very tall. He's like stacked leprechauns. Yeah. Well, maybe. do leprechauns have to be short? Maybe that's what she was saying. Oh mm. no, I'm not mm. so sure." Well, anyways, but what happened after the guy, she tried to do the that? Guy, the guy says this is a uh, she fired. She he he refused to wear the leprechaun costume, and she fired him. And uh, and and he says this is a violation of his basic human rights, his basic human dignity, not to have to dress up as a leprechaun. And he's of course wrongly fired. <laughs> So yeah. where do you weigh in on this issue? Is is being forced to wear a leprechaun suit, is that a violation of your basic human rights? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, none of us were there. Uh, mm -hmm. So the the specific facts, it's always hard to dig into those from a, you know, far off perspective. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, there, there are a number <laughs> it, it, it of issues here, It kills your here, dignity right? here, right? Well, and, yeah. I mean, there's discrimination at play there if you're, if you're trying like, to. Because these guys short? Because well, he's got red hair. Wait a minute, you have red potentially, hair. Potentially, we don't know. Yeah, potentially, the, you know, you can definitely have some discrimination issues there. There's some employment law issues. I mean, uh, you know, at that level of government, uh, I'd assume there's probably some sort of employment contract. Um, you know, specifically with government positions, you also have to deal with um, sort of the right to your job, which is mm -hmm. a, an additional level of federal protection that you've got mm -hmm. when you're working for the federal government. Um, so, I mean, there's there are a ton of uh, that's a that's just a a nest of legal issues right there. You could spend an entire semester working on that one case. Yeah. So she could fire. So she could say to her aide, Hey, you've got to wear a suit and tie and I want you to wear a green tie. And right. so he's got, he's, and then if he doesn't, he refuses. Can she fire him for that? Well, well can you dictate that in yeah, a job? It depends. It depends on the rights, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of standard um, employment contract law, right? Mm -hmm. Whether or not he's got the right to sort of dress himself or whether the employers have a right to dictate what he wears. I mean, you see that all the day, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you go to just about any restaurant, you'll see everybody in uniform. Exactly. That's mm -hmm. what it, you go to Wendy's and everyone has to wear. And, and it's, it may be a, and if I had to get a job at Wendy's tomorrow, it would be a violation of my basic human rights to wear that striped shirt. And, uh, and I would think so. I, I mean, think you agree to that when you're employed by them, mm, that and, you will wear the uniform. And that's a good point. I hardly doubt. I, I doubt if he actually agreed uh, in, in his employment <laughs> to, to wear whatever costume uh, he was designated to wear. So on our final uh, lighter side story, I want to talk about a judge who said this case is stupid. Ooh. And uh, I just I just thought that was funny because I was in court yesterday and the judge basically said the same thing to <laughs> us. He was like, you attorneys, you guys come up here and uh, you throw things out and you just hoping something will stick. 
And of course, he continued the case and made us bring in and wants us to bring in experts. And he basically said the same thing to me. He said, this case is, <laughs> and I'm like, judge, I know this case is stupid. We are, we're hoping you dismiss. We're the defendants here, you know? And, uh, but here a magistrate court judge has actually said this case is stupid. Everything about this case is stupid. And it deals with Elon Musk and uh, the guy who rescued like, 12 uh, Taiwanese kids yeah, out of a cave or something like that. I don't know if you guys remember that incident, but it's supposedly Elon Musk has tweeted that the guy is a pedo. Yes. <laughs> uh-huh. So you he did do that. He yes. did, he well, did do that. I heard he did do that. Yes. Yeah. And so, well, there's a judge who has to decide because now it's in court and uh, there's conflict breaking out. And the judge is, there's a judge who now has to decide this. And she has basically said, Everything about this case is stupid. What is it she has to decide? Um, she has to decide uh, basically what what's happened is there there is a reporter who has who supposedly has a relationship with Elon Musk and and the the side of of the uh, guy who has been uh, slandered or libeled. Uh, he is trying to force this guy to testify as to his relationship with Elon Musk. And um, and that's the, actually the, the what the issue that's before this specific judge is kind of a side a, bar, a side issue, and um, and so and so uh, the judge has basically said this case is stupid, this whole thing is stupid, everything about this thing is stupid, and uh, I mean it sounds like an evidentiary an evidentiary issue, so I don't know if that qualifies as being stupid. I don't know, Francis, have you ever had an experience of a judge telling you your case was stupid? No, um, but certainly there are times where I've felt that way, right? You, you get up and you have to start arguing about stuff. Um, I've had judges refer to things in a way that they sort of let you know that they agree that this is a stupid issue to be fighting about. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of the, one of the problems of lawyers, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's it's the advocate's position to advocate zealously. And, and if you give up ground – on any point where you could be gaining it, um, you're not doing your job. Mm-hmm. So it can it, stuff like this happens all the time. And, it's and because- oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> no, okay. we are just about out of time. Um, that seemed like a nice place to end. Uh, <laughs> but this has been Lewis on the Law on the Legal Hour on News 920 AM. The answer. We hope you'll join us next week. Thank you so much for stopping by.